day and welcome back to the 40 OT podcast with your host Mr. Thomas Henley. How are you guys doing today? Today we're going to be doing a little bit of a different episode as always. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to be talking about autism and rap and I have a special guest on tonight, um, SD Flame, who's going to be talking about their experiences. How are you doing? What's up? So my name's SD Flame. A little bit of background about me. I'm from a city of Mississauga. It's located in the greater Toronto area, the GTA. I've been in Toronto twice for opportunities with the nonprofits. I won a small press one this summer. I did a lot of training and I'm happy to be on the show. I also went and inspired, I'd say like about over a hundred people with disabilities outside my music too, to push more with motivation mm -hmm. talks with this music. And, um I'm right in thinking that you are autistic yourself and ADHD. Yep. yep. Got diagnosed so, four and a half. <laughs> four and a half. Wondered why the hell I was in a hospital, but I was in a hospital. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, I, I actually have a um, invested interest in, in sort of rap music and stuff. Cause I, I think when we had our pre-chat, I was talking about my, my playlist of dark trap uh, which is like trap music's form of rap and then dark trap's yeah. like the heavy metal equivalent of it. Very strange music. What what did you think about it? I didn't really check it out, but I feel like it's giving me kind of like suicide boy vibes or some shit like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well it's 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 not like um it's not like emo rap. I yeah. Mean, I'm 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 partial to a bit of emo rap, but um mm -hmm. I do I do like all the like the old school stuff. Uh, Biggie Smalls is like one of my like go to. For me, for me, it was Nas. For me, I love a lot of Nas. Yeah. J. Cole. Oh, J. Cole. Love J. Cole. Yeah. It's really cool. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I mean, I, I've always, music's always been quite a big part of my life. And, you know, throughout the years, it kind of, your your music taste kind of adapts to what circumstances you're in and what you see yeah. and people around you. And, I thought it'd be really interesting to kind of to talk about your experiences. So how did you start rapping and how, how has your autistic experience influenced your music? All right. Well, before you understand my story in hip hop, you got to understand how the greater Toronto area is like and how, Different. and how um, this kind of dragged into me. So growing up, I spent my teen years in what I consider like more of the culturally mixed areas. So if you're from, if you ever heard from Toronto, whatever, my city itself is 50% or more immigrant population. Mm -hmm. So um, growing up, I was around um, the Arabs, South Asians, Latinos, Caribbean people, and um, very diverse place it's a very diverse place growing up like you can even tell in the slang in my area is like even mixed with a bunch of cultural words or different languages and whatever so it's like but one thing that was brought us all together was hip-hop it was like that one thing that we had uh, some guys who were considered some bands were considered like the local legends of the mm -hmm. area like the local rappers who they bid to toronto they done it up and some of them aren't just like famous in the neighborhood. They're famous through the city. Yeah. Yeah. So we had a bunch of those bands, like they really brought it together and that's where, that's where kind of like was the influence for me. So what kind of got me to start going through hip hop and whatever was I was introduced at 15, but I didn't really think too much of it. I was just someone who's just listening to rap 16 or whatever. Nothing was stuff. going for me in life. Like I was 16 years old and felt like my life was going to. Sh <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like I came from a bit of a conflicting household. My family did the best for me, but they were in some harsh circumstances at the time. School, you know, same thing with every autistic person bullied. You Awful. really felt like you had no place to go except like you were just chilling at random spots. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So it's like kind, kind of like of... so being like a social drifter or like a wallflower. Yeah, you're just so it's kind of like, like you're... observing 
people. So so it's like you're like walking around. It's like you're a stray dog, yeah. basically. So <laughs> when so this this day happened for me, right? I was um, 16 years old in the cafeteria. And I was preparing to a battle. I didn't think it happened, but I won the f- battle. <laughs> Was that like a like a rap battle, like standoff? Yeah, cafeteria kind of like... battle, cafeteria rap nice. battle. You know, and I won the battle. On that point, I was gladiator mode, ready for whatever comes next. And the rest of my high school experience, I battled, and I struggled in life probably up to like my twenties, and I'm doing better now. Hmm. And what kind of? Because. My my experience of of secondary school, it was very. I don't know. I was I was kind of like you said, sort of a bit of a stray dog. You just kind of drift around different areas, and I tended to like congregate in specific places. One one being the library, and um, I don't I don't know. I think you know, looking looking back on my ex, my experiences, I think. A lot of the a lot of the drifting that I did, a lot of like going around and, and meeting different people was I was trying to find people like me, like <laughs> who understood me. And I was I was kinda I, I was mean, trying to find something for myself in this situation because it's like mm-hmm. I had trouble holding a job. Me and the other people in my situation, other people with disabilities, we were angry as shit. Yeah, yeah. Like cussing, like we'd be in a rec center or whatever. And it was like, I started battle rapping here and here and there. And so you um, had like social groups or was it well, like it was, just the crew at school kind of thing? There was different like places and whatever. It's like one thing I got to realize about my neighborhood too, is that a lot of people picked up a craft, for example, to keep themselves mm. out of a worse situation or try to sure. better their situation. So it's like, not just, me and ableism but people were taking a bunch of other too they were marginalized too so i didn't grow to high school in the same neighborhood uh, i'm from but at the same time it was like a lot of us came together and it was either giving up a camera are you a musician are you an athlete what can mm-hmm. you do I, I know you mentioned about your sort of experiences in the household do you think that that like is that something that you want to elaborate on or just kind of Sure it just about. got better over time. It just got better over time. I knew that at the end of the day, I feel like my family did the best for me, despite the situation mm-hmm. they were in at the time. It was probably I was like a harsh divorce. So that's the yeah. best way I could kind of like explain it. Everyone's kind of just doing better now. Good. Good. Well, um, I know you, you were mentioning something about sort of secondary school and stuff. Did you like my 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 particular experience of secondary school was quite isolating and anxiety provoking and i had a lot of individuals from different areas of the school different parts of my day who were quite confrontational like quite uh well they they bullied me basically which you know that that had such a massive impact on how I viewed life and other people when I left secondary school. Is that some, is that something that you've experienced that kind of bullying aspect? I was like traumatized when I left. I didn't know what to do with my life. That's why I say I struggled a bit, even in my twenties, because it was like, I was struck. I was having trouble holding a job. I was unemployed. Most of the jobs I did held were in the nightlife. So like dishwashing mm-hmm. for bars sure, and whatever. And it was like, it just wasn't an easy environment to be in. Your life was a mess. You were like broken, whatever, and you're trying to make something come out of it. That's sure. what made me take rap more seriously at 19 because I just felt like I needed something to do. Part of the reason why I say stay blessed at the end of my videos is that I'm happy that things didn't get worse for me. I'm yeah. blessed every day that I wake up and I got something to fight for for more. Mm-hmm. Blood. You know, when when you were telling me about your your story, sort of in the pre chats, you know, I I identify a lot with you know what you're trying to do at that at that age that you're talking about, around sort of early or late teens, early twenties. My focus was to be an athlete, so I was like, oh right, I need to to get on that and that sort of endeavor, that 
idea in my head of getting to a certain place was enough to kind of pull me along through all the, the difficult times at school, particularly. Yeah. So it was like, same with kind of me too. Like I was a very kind of in his own kind of zone kind of person. But yeah. then over time too, I did learn how to socialize. I had some homies mm. who were club promoters. They took me out. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> so awkward, but I made it work. Yeah, I just yeah. made it work. <laughs> and in a way, I kind of networked away myself through not just my city, but through the whole greater Toronto area. Mm -hmm. So I've been to downtown Toronto. I've been like, I've been to a lot of places. I've been in Toronto even recently for training opportunities to train in some programs. And is that I programs graduate. for you or programs that you're helping? No, these are with. programs for me to like train in hip hop and sure, sure. do better, do better in with too. But like, I, I'm happy I went through it and made me into a better artist at the end of the day because it helped condition yourself to work on yourself and uh, figure out more of what you got to do. Mm -hmm. I um, I you mentioned something about sort of the like the socializing and the social landscape, and we'll we'll touch on that in a sec. But um, before we uh sort of logged on to to do this podcast, I had to look through your music. Um, I well, I searched your name in on Spotify. I had to look at some of them, and I like th the two that that really stood out to me was I liked the uh, redemption shot song. Um, but I also liked like some of the, um, particularly the song Ladies Night and Ice Like Winter Heat. Wait, I can't see the rest of that. Like Summer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Summer. So it was like, it was like in a kind of way you felt like you were this uncommon breed with this kind of shit. So mm. it was like when you're in these places and whatever, I was trying to think of a way to like kind of rise up from the shit you were in mm. and whatever it was like my nights are sleep as i'm trying to go be something gotta work and grind that's what i find pain hustling and work put it together combined and you my remind that i'm one of a kind that kind really, of thing yeah yeah i love i like when, when you when you get like the flow going on the songs like this i i, I really like it it's um i'm not i'm obviously i'm not like a music industry person so i don't know all like the lingo and stuff but like i like the so like a lot of the songs they're kind of sort of laid back and quite i don't know it, it kind of gave me some of the songs gave me like you know like ice cube kind of chilling back and sort of rapping about stuff i kind of like, wanted to have that kind of sound with me but i still wanted yeah. something that it would hit hard so that's what mm -hmm. i was trying to go for yeah. That's what I was trying to go make happen with it. And in a way, too, a lot of mans would like chill back and listen to my music. Sometimes mm. they'd be drinking or even having a smoke. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's kind of funny to look back and it's, I appreciate them all. Don't get me wrong, I love them and, and whatever. But it's just one of those things where it was like we were more chill back and mm. doing this it kind of shit. I like it because there's there's some of the songs in there where you kind of like, I mean to be honest with all of them you've been like very sort of experimental with like how you're rapping and like the ways that you rap. It's like it's quite um it's quite cool, like for me as a as a as a listener to kind of because some rap rappers they kind of have the some of them have like quite a diversity in the ways that they rap and some of them are like pretty just like they've got one kind of rap voice and they just go with it and i like i was to... doing a lot to find my voice in this i was mm. doing a lot to like i was doing too much probably even to like try to find your flow and cadence and your style yeah, man. i had an idea in my mind of what i wanted to do but it takes a long time for it to come out of you yeah and man. that's where i had to be mentally conditioned to mm. I think it's um like uh it's it's good like it, even sort of trying to draw a comparison to my own life I think you know experimenting with topics and YouTube videos and podcasts and stuff it's always 
like very important because you got to kind of nail down like your niche and your your way of delivering things and you know what you talk about who you talk to i kind of like to do a bunch of things too like i kind of like to draw mm-hmm. from new perspectives there's times i like writing club bangers there's times I like writing some more serious deep storytelling sh- it depends sure. what what i feel at the time it depends what i want to kind of aim Mm-hmm. I have like notebooks behind me of a bunch of uh whatever I could I could do I can do. I have notebooks of punks, notebooks, stacks and stacks of lyrics. Nice, and at one nice. point too, what made other rappers see it had potential and other people in music see I got potential, even though I wasn't at the skill level they thought mm-hmm. I should be at was my lyric writing. Mm. because they were like, if we figure out how to get it out of him, what he's got written on paper, he is going to be lit. Yeah, man, I, I, I definitely saw that. I, I can definitely, we'll see it. I heard it. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, I can definitely I had hear that, say that. Like, I had one homie say that to me like years later. He said, well, me and him were having a phone conversation. And I said to me, well, at the time, I didn't think that you were that good, but he said you had potential because <laughs> mm-hmm. of what you were writing. Sure. And then I um, suppose sort of jumping back a little bit to the first point, I mean, how exactly did you did you go about starting? Like, was it was it that situation with the rap battle that that's when you, you started to get more into it? Or did you like... You know, in 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 your notes in class, just like writing down lyrics and. I've done cool. that. I've done that. I freestyle in front of mirrors, but when I started building a recording studio, I would say about twenty twenty one. Hmm. I started taking um, the money that I got from working all these hard ass jobs <laughs> from. Oh, bro, I got stories for you. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. Go. Okay. So me and a few other dishwasher disabilities, we're all working this one spot in the downtown part of my city in this mall. And it was an arcade venue, nightlife place. Hmm. And we would have stories of people being like drunk. <laughs> one person I think told me that we were all working the pit and there was an emergency exit from the VR room to the dish pit. Someone fell through. <laughs> oh my god! Wait, the, the VR room, <laughs> like virtual reality. You have. Oh my god! So it's like, what? Well, just descri- describe this complex, this uh, was, this place, because it's so. When this place first opened up, I got fired and hired the same day. I I probably hold the record for shortest employment. Uh, unemployment rate at um, my employment service for special needs in my area. <laughs> sure, sure. So I um, I lost my job at a local grocery store. I have a trouble thing where I couldn't talk to customers and work at the same time. Hmm. One would f- one would fall off. Whatever. It was a big ass place to work. Is, that, is it kind of like kind of like a like a gambling place, or is it like? No, nah, I didn't gambling. It's just a arcade place. Uh, the casino is way too far from there. Sure. <laughs> so this is where it gets pretty fucking hilarious. So I went and prayed for a bit. I kind of believe in my own philosophies and that kind of shit too. But being an Italian boy you're raised to be Christian a bit. So mm. I went to church, prayed for a bit, took what I call an ADHD nap when I got home, lied down and stared up at your popcorn ceiling in your townhouse. <laughs> <laughs> so after that, I'm like, okay, that job fair still happening. So took a shower, put on some sh- for a job interview, went and printed out my resume, went over there like nothing happened. Went it in line. And it was like the most craziest interview. 
process I've been through. Like we were playing games and, sh- and one of the corporate executives had a clipboard and we're assessing you. Yeah. So I just go in there and fucking wing it <laughs> and just say, whatever. So I go in there, play the games, joke around here and there. Next thing you know, the head chef comes out of there saying, you're all hired. I call my mom and um, she's upset that I got fired that day. But then she's like, what? You got hired? And I'm like, yeah, mom, I did. She told my nonno. My nonno yeah. didn't believe her either. <laughs> is, what, what, what was like the, the job description? Was it, is it just kind of looking after the machines? and like, I was a dishwasher. A dishwasher, yeah. So a bunch of me and a bunch of other dishwashers who were near divergence would go there and work. Mm. And um, because the percents were low, a lot of us ended up in the downtown area of the city working because they were always were hiring. Sure. So, but at the same time, it wasn't easy though. Yeah. Like what, what was the kind of like the dynamic? Was it like you were, you were in an organization and, or, or getting help from an organization to go and find work and you kind of, you and your buddies kind of all went together or did you meet them and just find out that they were neurodivergent as well? They kind of just got hired over Mm. time. Sure. So it was like, it is what it is. Like we were just all in employment service and I probably still hold the record for the shortest employment rate there. (laughs) (laughs) Unemployment rates. And for like five hours. Yeah, man. It's, um, it's real tough, isn't it? Like, like there's a, there's a lot of statistics around unemployment and autism. It's yeah. Like it's like. 18% 18% full-time employment. It's crazy. Something some sh- like that. Yeah. So like I worked there. So at one point I was working this place freestyling while working. Nice. I freestyled nice. at other bars if I I was going to ask you. Yeah. Got <laughs> out early enough. I have a story where it was like, I had some stories here and there. I freestyle at other bars in the area. It is what it is like. <laughs> well, um, like, because I know you, you mentioned before about sort of the the like the social aspects of of rapping. I guess uh, what I, I want me to, to get ask more is, into it. Yeah, I was just wondering, like, how did you uh, how did you actually navigate like the the social world? Because I imagine it's the music industry is a bit different to kind of well, um, it, normal everyday jobs. It's like this. First of all, this goes for anyone who grew up in my area or whatever, in my city, everyone had a code of respect. Sure. So when you're in a room, you shake hands with everybody in the room, even if you don't know them, you introduce yourself. So there's that to consider. I would say you got, it's a bit of also just knowing how to navigate and network because the music industry itself is very, it's all about, well, most of it's about who you know. Yeah. So if you could find somebody and you could strike up a conversation, that's the best way to handle it. I've been like the nightlife for years. So a lot of my music connections in the beginning came from being at bars or clubs. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I would like network around. And also my city was very entrepreneurial. So it's easy to find somebody who probably is trying to start out and do a thing and do their and be on their grind people would hand out business cards yeah, at, yeah. At, everywhere from bars to clubs some nice. motherfucker might pass his business card <laughs> <laughs> so it always about that so i'd say there's that i'd say respect you respect the people at the top and mm. uh they respect you back a lot of it had to do with respect with like respect and coming off of someone who gives respect but at the same time someone like that should be respected in a way too like i don't know if it's because of my disability but there's just times i in the back of my head i'll hear a voice and it's like mother prove yourself like right when i get about that mic yeah and it's like i feel like i don't know if it's what i've been through or the trauma i faced or what that was but it just it's always kind of there whether i'm doing an open mic 
or is performing anywhere. So I would say that kind of like like either if a positive self talk. Like is that is that the kind of thing that you're going for? Is it like it's a bit of both because like, then you put a lot of pressure on yourself, hmm. and you go through a lot. Your nights are sleepless. You're a bit of that. Yeah, I would say, but at the same time too, it's what I would say too, when it comes to everything about the social aspect of the music industry, when I went to Toronto, it was a very kind of similar situation, but now you're around people who are even way more high up Mm. because when I applied for the places to be in Toronto for training, you know, they have a interview process, you get in, you go in there and you talk to a lot of people. I've been around Juno nominated artists, which are kind of like our top awards for Canada. Mm-hmm. I've been around people who um, said they worked with Drake. Wow. And all that. So I would say people are relatively chill there, but at the same time, you just don't want to come off as like, I would say you, you don't want to be cocky or don't want to yeah. be kind of yeah. like acting like you're some big man when you're not like you got you is, that, want- is that something that you've learned is it did you have to like learn that or is it kind of hey it's a little bit of it's a little bit of both i feel like there's times i probably bigged up myself in some situations where i felt like i could have done better i don't have mm-hmm. to be like that you don't have to be so ego intuitive but at the same time though you learn from it and you figure out how to do better next time you go in there kind of shake hands so it's like it's a bit of knowing yourself worth i'd say but also learning to keep humble but also mm. wanting more and to push and be on your grind your hustle yeah it seems like you've got kind of like the the social landscape quite sussed out like you uh i mean did, were there any situations that you had that that really kind of you know you, being autistic sometimes we struggle to sort of comprehend very complex things that aren't like said to us to our face do you find that there's been situations where perhaps you're not really getting things has become an issue oh i got a i got a funny story with you on this one (laughs) okay (laughs) so stories are rolling (laughs) like it so at one point this is where i look back and i say i could have done better (laughs) so I uh, knew this other other MC from the same area as I'm from, and me and him knew each other for years. He's seen me from when I was 19, still trying to take it more seriously and whatever. And yeah. it's been ironed out between me and him. <clears throat> He's forgiven me. I apologize for the way I was or whatever. As everyone else is getting more opportunities except me. And I, when I remember I went to, I think, one of the uh, events he was doing, and I was like, at the end, been kind of complaining and whatever, and he kind of... He kind of like roasted me a bit too, but after said at the same time, well, we'll go look for it. And and the next thing you know, he sent me a message on and uh, he showed me that Toronto was looking for more people for a training program. And I put my application, got it. First opportunity in Toronto. Nice. nice. So, (laughs) so that was like, what is like, you want opportunity? Here's your fuck opportunity. (laughs) Is there any like programs that are for like disabled people to get into the music industry? I would say um, my area, I'm still looking for them. Yeah. I'm still looking for them. The majority of the places I trained for hip hop and rap were more of like POC places. Mm -hmm. Some members of the LGBTQ community were there. There are other people with disabilities there too. Other people with ADHD and other situations too so that is one thing to kind of consider but at the same time though you just want to go in there and just show you're respectful yeah i like that i guess something that i want something else that i wanted to ask was you know what kind of aspects of being autistic or being adhd do you think as like contributed positively to your to your rapping your, your career okay so the thing about this is where we're getting to mental conditioning mental hmm. conditioning 
when you're dealing with, let us say, a neurotypical brain, there's different parts you condition. Like they obviously condition like neurotypical rappers to think faster. Yeah. And all that stuff when I already have ADHD. <laughs> <laughs> You've already got that. You took it off. I already, bit, I'm like, so <laughs> you already are thinking at, at faster speeds than the average person. So that, that can help in a lot of situations with freestyling or coming mm. up with songs. Mm. You kind of just stim a bit, have repetitive thoughts. You have a hook. Yeah. Yeah. You have a hook or whatever. And um, you just put it on your voice notes on your phone. You play it and you figure, you put it all together. You get a hook and a verse. You just know how to like connect thoughts better, whether you're freestyling, writing a song. Also, the energy helps you too. Hmm. Being so you able think to- that like kind of is, is the way that you kind of go about making making songs producing songs is like do you do you ever like sit down and just like write a, write lyrics or is it kind of like if you have an idea and you're like oh that'll be sick and make a voice note or jot it down on your notes or something uh, it depends the situation i'm in i have a very kind of i would say scattered way i create <laughs> I'm, a, I'm an organized mess <laughs> Yeah. So likewise. <laughs> so it's like when it comes to I'd say that when it comes to the autistic part with helping you with rap, you're more creative than the average person. I swear, I probably didn't lose my childhood imagination. Yeah. Yeah. So when you're coming up with similes, punchlines, metaphors, and, and wordplay, it's a bit easier for you. That's how you're such a vivid lyrical person, because you mm. picture it. And yeah. you make it, and you make yeah. it work in that kind of sense. I think it's it's interesting that isn't it? Because autistic people we tend to focus more on like, I guess more more direct communication, like uh, speaking just from one end to another, rather than sort of morphing it. So I, I guess like the act of going in and writing lyrics and sort of all that wordplay and stuff would come quite naturally to us. Yeah. Like that's the part. Those are the parts of like being autistic helps with rapping and gets you through to people at the mic. Hmm. I guess I'm guessing like the, the hyper focus is probably a good one as well. Yeah. It helps too, especially in a that situation. Also, don't get wrong, I'm a neighbor too. There was a bunch of other European immigrants there too about that part too so let's say i would say yeah it was everyone ca- so i'd say yeah it's like you got to know how to combine certain parts of your disability and make them work mm-hmm. and once you figure out that part of mental conditioning but it takes a long 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 time do you ever get burnt out yes you can get burnt <laughs> out behind this place there was times i wanted to throw this shit out a window yeah yeah but at the same time this is expensive. Yeah. You could spend hours down here and you could lose track of time. Yeah, so it's like, it, it does affect you. It's rap is, it's a creative artistry form, but I feel it's like a competitive sport too. Mm-hmm. So when you're, yeah, when you're in these situations, you are very um, kind of, it could be very like stressful too. You could be burned out. You can wake up and you're like your voice and feel like, right. You wake up with headaches. Mm. You gotta take a moment to take a minute, breathe it out. It can be very, it can be taxing on you mentally too. That's mm. by the same time. That's why you're conditioned too. So it's like when you're the part of the mental conditioning is that now you got to deal with detents. Sometimes when I breathe behind the mic, it isn't just to catch my breath, but to slow my heart rate. Yeah, yeah. To slow my heart rate or to kind of slow the way your brain's thinking and adjust it to a BPM. Mm, mm. I find it um I find it really interesting, sort of the dynamic of the creative industry, because you know, the people who like we know that people are more creative when they're relaxed, when they're a bit kind of slow, they're not rushed. Mm-hmm. whereas like things like you know the music industry and even to be honest even things like related to social media and the youtube it's kind of like 
you have to be creative, but you also have to do it quickly <laughs> or as quick as you can. Or you just kind of like, you know, it's like every day for me, I have to like come up with a new idea for a post and a reel and then try and sort out my videos and edit that to get that in and talk to this person. And it seems like <laughs> everything's just, <laughs> you know, yeah. the, the, the creativity in me, in me needs like a space to just like breathe and just like, jot things down on my notes but we live such a fast-paced lifestyle sometimes it's hard to to get that time yeah so it's like it's very so with hip-hop it could be very fast-paced and so when it comes to even when i'm at the stage i'm about at the mic behind it i don't do this every time but like when let us say i'm in a high pressure situation i always wear a pair of sunglasses and a hat mm. to kind of help yeah. keep myself focused in the zone this is because i find I find camera cameras daunting. I find the stage lights kind of daunting too. <laughs> it could get to you because you're because yeah. you're in such a high pre- that, that that situation. When you're in that situation, right before you go on stage, I can't sit still. I'm breathing it out. I'm like bouncing on the on the the balls of my feet. Yeah, and it's like you're getting ready to to go for a fight. Get get it get, like you're, it's basically like you're conditioned to fight yeah. in that moment, and so I do my thing, do my set, and uh, it's done for. But the, just the pressure that builds up. So it, every time I go up on stage, I'm always wearing. I'm gonna show you this right now. Get for it. So this this to me is like putting on armor. So you always like kind of. Yourself a bit ready. I might take off my uh, headphones mm. for a second. But you could even put your hoodie up, but you get the damn point. Yeah, yeah. So it's like it's kind of you... like mental conditioning, isn't it? It's like when I put these this stuff on, now it's time to go. And it's like, yeah. It's time to time to get up on a stage now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um I think there's there's a lot of utility in like sensory things like sunglasses. And, I would say um, I just always carry them around now because mm. any moment could just be, they could tell you to freestyle right there. Yeah. And you just got to, you got to be ready to be conditioned right there and then. It's not like I have like a, it's not like I ever have a calm day with it. Well, I do, but when I'm out in public or whatever, like, well, it depends. If I'm just with the homies and it's a small little circle, I get freestyle without this shit on. Yeah. But when I'm on like a stage situation or like a venue situation, I put it on. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I found it really interesting listening to you talk about it because it's, you know, as you're speaking about your experiences with your music career, I'm I'm constantly making links to like my experiences as an athlete. Like yeah. it was the same for me. Like I, I just, there's been a lot of times actually before going on and fighting, I, uh, I had panic attacks. I had meltdowns. I, you know, like my, my, my GI tract was like on fire, like pretty much every single time before a competition. And the noises were awful. The, the lights are so bright. I wish I could have worn sunglasses. Like (laughs) there's so many aspects to like actually going out there and doing it. That was so hard. It was the training that I found quite like this, the training that I liked mostly i like fight i like fighting and competing and you know it gave me passion and a reason to to do the training but the actual experience of the the environment was like very very um i don't want to say triggering because i don't like that word but triggering is probably i love hip-hop though despite all this i went through i love being a rap i have a passion for this i I have a lot of respect for the old heads that came before me. Some of the people who trained me to do this and had the patience to. Yeah, yeah. So for me, I I love what I do at the end of the day. It's just, it could be a lot on yourself too. Just yeah, seeing man. that this was something that I started with a USB mic and dollar on my headphones. Mm-hmm. To now having all... Humble beginnings all of this and like them. we uh, and just having stories of the bros just building makeshift recording studios and 
card this, mod. <laughs> at the same time, though, there's a chill side of the environment too. Like, I can't drink when I'm when I'm rapping because mm. it just affects your focus behind the mic. Yeah, yeah. Or like, it, it slow, slows your brain down, doesn't it? It slows your brain a bit and whatever. So you need a bit, or it's either you're drinking and you like have like a glass of water right next to you. <laughs> Yeah. And so, and even then, it's probably like a light beer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's like, I I enjoy it at the end of it. I would say my favorite parts of being in rap and hip hop, I would say is when you're performing, and you feel it and mm. that you got that fire in you to make that sh one of the best moments you had. And also just, I would say seeing it's like, hey, bro, you killed it tonight. <laughs> Yeah, man. You killed it tonight. And uh, there are some situations too where I'd be at like a store, or whatever, just chilling myself. And uh, one of the other men who organized me from a bar, or whatever, would be like, hey, I saw you perform, <laughs> perform nice. a while back. And it's like, I got to take a double take. Nice. Where I know this, where I know this man from. And uh, it just turns into us shaking hands, talking it out for a bit. And that's probably it. So I would say at the end of it all, I enjoy what I do and what I make from it and everything. I feel like with anything that's worth fighting for in life, it's never easy. Mm -hmm. Nothingness. And in a way too, there's time I say to myself from my dish from being a dishwasher, I'm a line cook now. There's times in my back of my head where it's like, it's either a life in the pit or a life trying to go get it. Yeah, like it. <laughs> awesome. Did you ever do some like mental conditioning for fighting or anything? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think a lot of the mental conditioning for me was just like, I, I used to go really hard on the training. Like I probably overtrained like a lot and I didn't eat much because I had to stay in like a weight category. I used to, I used to go out on like like when when everyone was off for the summer holidays, kind of going out and meeting up and partying and stuff. I'd be like writing myself like a free session a day program. I'm like, <laughs> but I I wore myself out so much of that time, but I just always just kept like going for it and and grinding it. And I think knowing that I that I did as much as I could really helped like with, with my mind on it. It's like, well, I've done everything that I can for this, uh, everything that I feel like I can. So yeah, it's in, as, I suppose the mental conditioning, I think is a, is a big part. And I think also stepping back a little bit from the results of what happened and rather, you know, highlighting the things that I'm getting better at and getting good at, getting worse at maybe and sort of adjusting because you know a lot of the competitions that i did were at the local level yeah i did do the international stuff and the sort of the big competitions but the local level stuff i needed to kind of take a step back say like okay i don't really need to win this i can just practice a couple of things in like actual competition and, and go for it and but I don't, I don't think I ever got the whole keep myself calm thing. I think I, I always really struggled. But the, the funny thing was is that everyone that saw me in competition, they always said, oh, you're like the chillest dude in the venue. <laughs> you're like, you look so relaxed and confident. I'm like, really? Because I just like feel like I need to go puke and like rock back and forth in the toilet. That's me sometimes. I have this weird thing where it's I'll be in such high pressure situations and I'll be like, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, you just kind of like. Hmm. It's funny in a, it's funny in a sense because I competed a bit in wrestling too and that was like a weight category thing too where it was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, did not, I did not do the weight stuff very well at all. I, I hardly anything. I was like, I'm, at this height, I'm about 6'3". I weigh about 100 kilos and I was the same height back then, but I weighed 72 kilos. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like a skeleton. Jeez. 
it's all about it's a with taekwondo it's all about like point scoring so mm. the longer legs that you can have for the weight class the better mostly yeah but yeah i i've really 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 enjoyed chatting to you and i think it's you know it's always interesting to hear the stories of of autistic people adhd people sort of doing different taking different routes in life it's always really great to kind of get an insight into you know how life is for other people chasing different things and i've re- I really enjoyed me. really enjoyed chatting to you so i guess usually at the end of the podcast i would kind of ask people for a song of the day so if you of... want to get do redemption, uh, you, <laughs> yeah. you, could, you could you could do that. I don't know if you want to put maybe the parental advisor sticker on this one because of how much I. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of crazy too because when I when I'm around other like autistic people or men are diagnosed too, we think yeah. a lot of neurotypicals are too soft. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we had this thing about us where we're like we'll bull each other too. Like we were always like kind of, we had our it's like in book. a different way though, isn't it? So <laughs> it's like you find humor in different things. We kind of were a bunch of smile to the bull kind of people. Like, yes, <laughs> we thought we were being bullshit and we knew it because <laughs> there was a bunch of other things that happened during all this and everything too, politi- like political stuff in my area. And we just kind of just sit back and we were like laughing of it and um just getting it all together too in terms of like music too i had family my music my family said music for years my mom was a church singer so was my nice. nonna so but at the same time i was just too crazy <laughs> uh so song of the day we're gonna go with redemption and that will be in the uh 40 40 podcast song of the day playlist on spotify you want to go check it out we've got all of the songs from previous guests as well as today's guest sd flame i've got one final question to ask you before we wrap things up have you enjoyed your time on the 4040 podcast my first podcast interview ever did (laughs) really this this is your first one yes it is nice it's my first podcast interview ever did i did a small press run and i have like two articles made about me ones back in the programs the one they did in a local news page well you you better you better blow up because then the episode is going to get like <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure you will i i see a lot of like potential and stuff in your music and i, I like it and yeah really great to talk to you man i hope you have a lovely rest of your day and to everybody listening i hope you've enjoyed this episode and if you want to get in contact the contact details as always is well you can go through my e- <laughs> <laughs> so if you have enjoyed this episode uh make sure to head over to my links uh they're all always down below you can check out the podcast on multiple different streaming services apple google spotify and of course the video version over on youtube uh, thomas henley that's where it is and if you want to stay up to date with the stuff that i'm doing maybe you want to check out the blog art blog articles the reels all of my social medias are at thomas henley uk apart from youtube and if you want to get in contact with me to perhaps be on the podcast or to um get me to do some training, public speaking, coaching, anything like that, go over to my website, thomashenley.co.uk, and you'll be able to find a contact card on that page. Are there any links that you want to share about, SD? Put my link tree. Follow follow my Instagram, Spotify. If y'all like what you hear, I promise you I'm releasing more. Come on. Awesome I'm even stuff. trying to get my TikTok going again. I'm trying to get everything together. Went through a minor setback, but I want to like do more with it too and like yeah. be more open. That was like one thing I challenged myself to be on this podcast today. Mm-hmm. Be more open. No, no, I, I, I really, really, 
really appreciate that and it's it's um you know it's 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 really great to hear especially and like if there's there's people who are watching sort of up and coming who are you know they're thinking of you know perhaps getting into an industry like the music industry um i'm sure your your words and experiences have you know done a lot for them i'd say my advice to any autistic person who wants to do what i do i would say start with um believe in your own creativity at the same time realize your talent but be willing to take criticism learn to learn from criticism and uh start small invest small before you end up getting way more into this mm-hmm. and start blowing more money into this that's just my advice to anyone who's uh watching this and wants to get into music and also the internet can help you too, but also connect with your local scene. Mm-hmm. Cool, man. Thank you very much for that. And with that, I hope you all have a very lovely day and I'll see you in the next episode of the 40 Orty podcast. Stay see you blessed. later, folks. Thanks. Appreciate having me.